So what happened was Tamim al-Dari after this incident of meeting a Dajjal, he goes to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Medina, and he tells him what he what he saw and the interactions. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, upon hearing this, wasted no time, and he got up immediately and ran to the masjid. Now, normally in in masajid, <coughs> this pulpit area of the mimba is meant for Fridays and Fridays only. Whoever stands there and gives a khutbah or lecture or things like that, at least for this masjid, it's only meant for Fridays. So anytime we see somebody standing here, if someone stood there after Salat al-Maghrib to Aisha, it's strange. What are you doing there? You're supposed to be sitting on a table like this. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam utilized that member that he had sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for announcements, for blog posts, for any type of thing that he needs to tell the ummah, he would use the member. With or without it being Friday. So it doesn't have to be Salat al Jum'ah that he would use. Other masajid, maybe not this masjid, but masajid that I have been to, whenever it's just a lecture after Fajr, for example, or after Aisha, for example, they would tell you to stand on the member. So this is something that is normal. Maybe not in this masjid, you have the table and mashallah, the microphone here. But other masjid, masajid, they have the lectures and everything like that while you're standing on the member. Our Prophet وسلم, used to do this. And any time he stood on the member, to give a lecture, or give a khutbah, or give a warning outside of Salat al-Jum'ah, the Muslims knew it was something serious. So he gathered all of the Muslims to rush to the masjid, it was an emergency. He run, all of the, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu are now running inside the masjid knowing it's an emergency. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with a face of distress, he says, He says, do you know why I've gathered you here all today? And the Sahaba radiallahu anhu said, What is it, Ya Rasulullah? Tell us. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam begins to tell them this hadith that I'm going to share with you today. Tamim al Dari radiallahu anhu encountered and, and fell into this island, like I said, because his boat was sabotaged. And now he goes to this, um, <coughs> this island with his group of men that was in uh, the boat with him. And they get to this boat and they see this creature called Al Jassasa. And Jassasa in Arabic means an informant, it means a spy. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam what type of creature was it? But Tamim al Dari radiallahu anhu described this animal as an animal or a creature that he has never seen before. And he mentions in this hadith that he says, I can't tell the face from the back and the back from the face. I don't know if it's his front, I don't know if it's his back. So I don't know because he was very, very hairy. This, this creature, Al Jassasa, was very, very hairy. And I couldn't tell his front or his back. So when Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhu, like I said, at this time he was a Christian monk, he wasn't a Muslim, and he meets this, this creature, and he says, who are you? And then Al-Jassasa says, I am Al-Jassasa. My master has been waiting for you. Mm. So Tamim al-Dari is like, what are you talking about here? I just fell into an island on a boat. This is not my destination. I didn't mean to come here. I'm looking for help. So he follows Al-Jassasa, to, uh, to this cave, and he enters into this cave, Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhu, and a group of his men, and when they enter into this cave, they see a man that is shackled. Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhu says that he saw a man. He didn't say, I saw a beast, I saw an animal, I saw a cyclops, I saw a zombie. He said, I saw a man. And his hands were shackled to his neck like this, and his legs were shackled together, his knees were shackled together, his ankles were shackled together, and his hands were shackled to his neck like this. So he had nowhere to go. And Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhu asked this man in this lengthy hadith, he says, who are you? And this man says back to Tamim al-Dari, he says, I am the one that's shackled, I am completely helpless, you came into my house, who are you? He has every right to say that. Because after all, he's in his home. And Tamim al-Dari says, I am X, Y, and Z. I'm Tamim al-Dari, I'm Christian, I'm a monk. I came with my group of men on a ship. It, you know, it, got, it crashed, and here we are on your island. So the man, the shackled man, he then begins to ask Tamim al-Dari very interesting questions. He says, since I have you in front of me, and you're from that area that you said you were from, can I ask you some questions? And Tamim al-Dari says, absolutely, go ahead. The very first question he asks, he says, tell me of the trees of Baysan. 
Now, where is Beisan? Beisan is a city that is located in modern day Jordan. And they are known for their date trees, just as Medina is known for their date trees. Jordanian dates are they're known as well. And Jordanian dates usually come from the trees of Beisan, which is a city in Jordan. He asked, Tell me about the trees of Beisan. And Tamim al Dari says, What do you want to know about these trees? He says, Is there a lot of trees there? And do it does it produce a lot of fruits? Tamim al Dari says, Yes, it is there's a lot of trees and it produces fruits. The man replies back to, to Tamim al Dari, he says, Soon these trees will become scarce and limited. Soon these trees will not exist anymore. And then he continues. He goes, Tell me of Buhaira al Tabariya. Tell me of the Sea of Galilee. This is a very famous sea that I'm pretty sure you've heard many, many times in the end of times of the, the ahadith that we hear about, about the last days. You will hear this sea mentioned many, many times. We mentioned it last time we spoke about Yajuj wa Mahjuj, about them swallowing this water. This is that same sea, the Buhaira al Tabariya, the Sea of Galilee. Tamim says, What do you want to know about this sea? The man says, is there water in this sea? Tamim al says, yes, there's a lot of water. The man says that water will soon dry up. If you Google today on the Sea of Galilee, it is drying at an alarming rate. This is an ocean, <clears throat> this is a sea, brothers and sisters, believe it or not, that, like I keep saying, the enemies of, of Islam have studied Islam more than majority of the Muslims. These people, the enemies of Islam, because they know, like I said, they know that Islam is the truth. They have studied it more than us, more than the Muslims, because they want to study as, as Sun Tzu, the famous Chinese war, you know, the, the famous book, The Art of War. He says, if you study your enemy, you will know your enemy. Study your enemy. And that's what they're doing. These enemies of Islam have studied Islam more than us. In fact, believe it or not, I remember, I recall a moment in high school, Franklin High, I remember we used to pray Luhr, and this shocked me, I remember as a kid. We were praying, we used to pray Luhr in one of the teacher's classrooms. And we were talking, you know, sometimes, you know, kids, we joke, and we, we're supposed to pray, <coughs> and we just joke, and we like to skip class, because we want to go pray Luhr away from our teachers. And so we unfortunately take advantage of that time, and we joke around and stuff like that. So the teacher that allowed us <coughs> to pray, mashallah, she was very nice, she was married to a Muslim, it wasn't a good Muslim, but she was married to a Muslim. <laughs> and she used to allow us to pray in her, in her classroom, Dhuhr. And I remember one time, a teacher that was in her classroom, which was a Yehudi, which was a Jew. And I'll never forget this. He was a Jew. And we were talking, joking, it's past time for prayer, past time for Dhuhr. He knows, she knows, that we're supposed to be praying. We're supposed to be praying. And we're joking. And the man said, he said, hurry up and pray before the Euphrates River dries up. And we all looked at each other and were shocked. Because what he mentioned was a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, in which he said that there will come a time before the Day of Judgment where the Euphrates River, which is the river in Iraq today, will dry up. And at that time, Iman will be limited. How did this Jew, non-Muslim, know the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ more than us Muslims? That shocked me. These people, dear brothers and sisters, are dangerous. These people, they know Islam more than us. And I told you there was a man named Dracula, the impaler. He memorized the Quran. Dracula, the, the one that fought Muhammad and Fatih, rahimallah ta'ala. Dracula memorized the Quran. And this is a man that used magic. This is why we call him Dracula, the famous movie. There's like a vampire and he bites and sucks the blood of people and they die and stuff like that. Dracula was a real person, and he was called Dracula the Impaler because he used to impale Muslims on the side of the road and she used to flex and show off that this was something that he used to do. This guy that used to impale and kill Muslims memorized the Quran. I would say majority of the Shabab now, including all of ourselves included, uh, what chunk of the Quran have we memorized? And these are the enemies of Islam that have memorized the Quran. So these people, they know what they're doing. And at Dajjal, when he says, Buhayra Tabari, the Sea of Galilee, the Yehud, they're watching this. They know these ahadith. But you see, dear brothers and sisters, when it comes to Hidayah, when it comes to guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can be Albert Einstein for crying out loud. You can be the smartest person in the world. But if Allah doesn't give you guidance, you can be the dumbest person in the world. 
Wallahi, the guided Muslim is smarter than the smartest kafir. Because in, the, on, in, on, in Jahannam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Mulk, when they will say, لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعْ أَوْ نَعْقِلْ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيدِ They will say, the, the smart individual that was a kafir, that was a disbeliever, they will say, if only we used our brains, we wouldn't be in Jahannam. Huh. So the, the, the quote-unquote not educated Muslim is way better than the smart non-Muslim. Because you have, you have gotten something that is not shown in books. Even the Qur'an cannot give that to you. And that is guidance. Guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that to you. So when we will come across a hadith in, in the story of Al-Dajjal, you will see that Muslims are reading the same Qur'an as us. Prime ministers, kings, princes, whatever you want to call them, they have the same Qur'an as us. Anybody in the world can go on Amazon, especially in America, and buy a Qur'an. And they can open the Qur'an. They can study the Qur'an in colleges for all they want. But if Allah does not want to guide them, Allah is not going to guide them. That's all that matters. You can have the Qur'an, you can memorize the Qur'an, you can learn ilm al-tajweed, you can learn ilm al-qara'ah, you can learn everything, usul al-fiqh, hadith, everything. If Allah does not want to guide you, it doesn't matter how much you know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet emphasizes this, especially in the story of the Dajjal, which we'll get to in a little bit, inshaAllah. So these enemies of Islam, they're keeping a good eye of the Sea of Galilee at this very moment. And he asks us about the Sea of the Galilee. He says, is there any water? And then Talim, at that time, he says, there's a lot of water. And the jackal man says, soon that water will dry up. Soon that water will dry up. Then he says, tell me of a well of Zagar, which is a well, a very famous well that is located in Jerusalem today, in Quds today in Palestine. Talim al daddy says, what do you want to know about this well? The man says, does it produce a lot of water? And do the people take from this water? Tamim al says, yes, it, yes they do. And then he doesn't say anything after. He doesn't say the well of Zaghar will eventually run out of water and they will have no more water left. Then he continues his next part of his conversation. He says, if that's so, if what you're telling me is true, then there must have been a man emerging from Mecca, from the Arabs. He must have emerged already and I'm assuming he has been to a city in Yathrib. Am I right? Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhu says, you're right. And he goes, what's his name? He goes, his name is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He goes, tell me about Muhammad. He goes, Muhammad is born from Mecca, came from Mecca like you said. His people kicked him out of Mecca and he sought refuge in another land called Yathrib, which is now modern day Medina. And the man says to Tamim al-Dari, it would have been better if they didn't kick him out. This shackled man says it would have been better if he didn't kick him out. So, then after all of this, the man then begins to describe who he is. After all of this conversation, he goes, if what you're telling me is true, then I am a Dajjal. I am a fitna that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring upon mankind. Now, we'll just stop there real quick. The average Muslim with little iman will be asking, How is a person alive for a thousand years? That's impossible. And he's shackled. How is that possible? We only live to 60, 70 years old. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he wants to do something, he's going to do it with or without your logic. He doesn't need your small peanut-sized brain to, to think of outside things. When, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something to happen, we demonstrated that. Many, many times in the Qur'an, many, many times in the Hadith, many, many times in the stories of the Prophets. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something to happen, nothing can stop it. If Allah wants to preserve a Dajjal by, we don't know how, but if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to preserve him, he will preserve him. Just like how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is preserving al-yadud wa ma'dud, we don't know where they are. Allah is preserving them for their specific time when they come out. And then he says, I am Al-Masih. We'll get to that term in a little bit. He says, very soon, based on what you told me, I will emerge. And there will be not a place in the world that I have reached. I have conquered in 40 days. He gives the duration of how long he will conquer this, this world. Except for Mecca and Qiba. He says, except for two cities. Mecca and Qiba. Those two, I am prevented to enter. 
When the Prophet وسلم, was telling his companions of this hadith, he had a staff in his hand and he began striking the ground. And he says, هذه طيبة, هذه طيبة, هذه طيبة. This is a tiba, Medina. This is a tiba. This is a tiba. So the Prophet وسلم, is telling the companions, this is the second city that he can't go. Mecca, he can't go. And Medina, this is it. He begins to hit his staff on the ground. The Prophet وسلم, says in a very distressful language, he says, Haven't I told you about this great fitna before? So it shows us that our Prophet وسلم, spoke to the Sahaba <coughs> about the Dajjal before this incident happened. It was only when Tamim al Dari met this man that it, it solidified what the Prophet وسلم, was saying the entire time. And then he says, The Prophet وسلم, says, For indeed, <coughs> And the hadith of Tamim amazes me. Indeed, the, the Dajjal is somewhere in the east of Medina. And he begins pointing in the east of, the, of Medina. Another of his attributes was mentioned in the hadith of Fatima bin Qais anha, in the story of Al-Jassasa, which is that, that creature that we mentioned in the beginning, and, which, and also in the hadith of Tamim al-Dari, it, it mentions and it says, <coughs> it says that we saw an enormous man, so it begins to describe. There's another part of the hadith that begins to describe what the what what the Dajjal looks like. Dajjal is the greatest fitna in human history. All of the prophets from the time of Adam, Noah, Isa, Musa, Sulaiman, Daud, whatever it may be, have mentioned this fitna of the Dajjal, and they told the people that this is the greatest fitna, the greatest test that the humans will see. Why is he called a Dajjal or a Masih? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, many times you'll see that a Dajjal and a Masih, they go together. A Masih al Dajjal. There is also someone else in Islam called a Masih, and that is Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, the son of Mary, alayhi salam. These two are called a Masih which in English is called the Messiah. You have the real Messiah, which is Jesus alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam. Then you have the fake and the Antichrist, the, and the, the liar, al Masih al-Dajjal. Masih in Arabic has numerous meanings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautifully, and His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uses wordplay here. It's the same exact word in Arabic, but in English, it's two different meanings. Masih in Arabic for Jesus السلام, is the one that wipes over the heads. Before, they used to do something called anointing, in which they would wipe over the head, especially for righteous people or special people. Isa السلام, did this to Yahya السلام, the son of Zakaria, to anoint him as a prophet. And he would rub over their heads. A lot of times in Catholicism as well, I think they do this as well. Sometimes in the church, they touch their heads. Um, back in the days in like TV, they used to do like church TV and people used to go, I need to pay my bills, you guys ever seen that before? And they go, Jesus needs to pay my bills and they touch their head, you notice that? That's called masah. And they go, Jesus, by the power of Jesus, and the guy goes, oh, oh, oh my bills have been paid, all oh, holy water. <laughs> you guys have seen that before, right? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, and they touch their heads. Why do they touch their heads? Because during the time of Isa, السلام, anointing, masah, he used to anoint and rub the heads of the people to give them special abilities and powers. And we know Isa السلام, was by God, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gifted certain abilities such as blowing into clay or dirt, it, it becoming a bird before their very eyes, um, giving the, the dead back, or bringing the dead back to life and what have you. <clears throat> and Dajjal is not called Masih because he will anoint people. He will not go around and say, I will give you life, give you life, and tap the people's heads. And Masih Dajjal means he will be mamsuh, he will be white. There will be a portion of his body which will be white and he will not have full vision like how you and I have it. He will have vision that is partial. He will not have full vision. This is why he is called al-mamsuh. It's white. It's not the real mas Messiah, which is Isa alayhi salam. So this is two messiahs. You have the messiah. The saved person that will, the savior will save us all, right? The Messiah is what they call Jesus alayhi salam, Savior. You've heard this many times. Savior, Jesus Christ, alayhi salam. Al-Masih. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him al-Masih. Al-Masih also in Arabic, or I'm sorry, in English, means Christ. This is why al-Masih, al-Dajjal, is the Antichrist. And al-Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, is Jesus Christ, alayhi salam. And like I said before, it is completely permissible for us as Muslims to say Jesus Christ, alayhi salam. This is why later on, we don't have that much history, inshallah, maybe when we start talking about Isa, alayhi salam, the Christians took that term because of what Isa, alayhi salam, uh, who he was. As far as uh, Jesus Christ had said. So, moving on. The meaning of the word a dajjal. Why is he called a dajjal? Dajjala or dajjala in Arabic. What they used to do is is scammers during the time of the Prophet sallallahu so, was they used to put like like uh, turmeric. You guys know what turmeric is? And they used to put coloring or like they used to make a paste and cover up their camels that they had when their camels had diseases and they would have patchy skin. Basically, they would put makeup on the camel to cover these diseases so they can sell them at a normal price. These were called dajana. These camels were called, oh, you, you're a phony, you're a scammer. You try to lie to us that it was a healthy camel, but then when you went home and washed your camel, and you put water on the camel, you realize it's a diseased camel the entire time. You're a liar. A dajjal is a person, a perpetual liar that lies all the time, deceives you, manipulates you, tricks you, cheats you, lies, steals from you, everything. That is what a Dajjal is. And a Dajjal, there are many Dajjalin, there are many Dajjals in the world, but our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is referring to the big, big Dajjal, which is the greatest fitna in human history. That's why he is called a Dajjal, because he is called the great deceiver. Now, Descriptions of a Dajjal and the Ahadith concerning a Dajjal. There are many, many Ahadith, but we'll try to go and summarize it with the best of our ability, inshallah. What will he look like? What a Dajjal will look like? Most of us, uh, as, as we've agreed upon already, that he is a son of Adam, meaning he is a human being just like us. He will be a young man. Now, when the Prophet Sallallahu mentions, and these are all in the authentic Hadith, when he mentions young man, it doesn't necessarily mean too young or too old. Shab in Arabic means from the age of puberty to the age of 40. So anyone that's not 40 yet, you're still considered Shabbat, mashallah, right, in Islam. So within that time, our Prophet ﷺ says that he will be a young man with a, com with a reddish complexion. Now in the Arab world, whenever you were red, meaning that you were light-skinned, it didn't mean that you had red skin on you. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during his time, Romans and white people didn't really exist during his time. Yes, they did, but they didn't really come to the Jazeera al Arab, the Arabian Peninsula at his time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when he compare, whenever you hear a hadith that mention Ahmad, redness in the skin, it doesn't mean the person is red. It means that the person was a little bit lighter than your average Arab. He's light skinned. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he described at the Jal, he said he will be a little bit lighter tone than you and I, which he's referring to the Sahaba and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he says about his, he will have a broad upper chest, blind or defective, mamsuh in the right eye, and this eye will be neither prominent nor sunken, and it will look like a floating grape. And I'm pretty sure you've heard this hadith many times before. What does this mean? It doesn't mean like his eyeball is coming out of his socket. He's not going to I'm the judge. Like, no, you're not. You're crazy. Right? It will come out. His eyes, both of his eyes are affected, by the way. But there will be one that will be more affected than the other. And he will have a defect. Now, with that being said, we live in a day and age of cosmetic surgery. We live in a day and age of people loving how to, to basically become gods themselves and transform their bodies. We live in this day and age. It could be, Wallahu ta'ala alam, this is just my theory. It could be that when a Dajjal comes out, he will look normal just like me and you. All of these descriptions that the Prophet ﷺ says about a Dajjal, he is bow-legged, he will walk funny, he will have curly hair, he is al ahmad he is light-skinned, his eye is like a protruding like a grape, he can't see in one eye. All of these things, it could be that when he was in the cave, it was like this. And perhaps when he gets out, with the money and the power that he has, I'm pretty sure he's not going to keep that. This is just a theory. It could be right or wrong, Allah Ta'ala Because the reason why I say this is because if we keep waiting for a man protruding an eye with a grave, we're going to wait, be waiting for a very long time. And a Dajjal is going to fool us. Dajjal is right in front of us telling us, oh yeah, I'm God. Like, this has to be God. 
because we're told that Dajjal has an eye protruding like a grape. This guy has good eyes. This guy, oh, he must be God. Why is it so important to highlight this? During the time when Ad Dajjal emerges, claiming that he will be God, as this is one, his number one fitna, that he will come to the world and claim that he is Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, <clears throat> this is a time where Iman will be at an all-time low. The lowest of Iman. And the people at that time, we ask Allah to protect us and our offspring, Allah ameen. Ameen, The ameen. people at that time will think that a Dajjal is God. How so? No food, no water, no homes, no family, no support, nothing. And when you're desperate and, and needing of something, when bread becomes a luxury, when water becomes a ni'mah, when you're fighting each other for water, when someone comes to you and tells you, I am God, I can give you water, I can give you bread, I can give you food, I can give you heat on the nice, the cold winter nights, I can give you heat. All you gotta do is believe me. Then your iman is tested. Right now, if someone came to you and you're mashallah at home and the heater's turned on and you have a nice blanket, and someone said, I'm God, you're like, yeah, whatever. I read Surah Kaf, this And you read Surah Kaf, it'll go away. But at a time when you're hungry, when we're fighting over bread, when your brother, your day one, mashaAllah, you ride or die for that person, here you are fighting for a loaf of bread, then that Dajjal comes, it is very different now. Your Iman is going to be tested. He will claim to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, and he will have abilities like no other. And the Dajjal will, like I said, will have some problems with his body, but Allah ta'ala ala, maybe, just maybe, he can do surgery and, and have these things fixed so that way he looks normal just like uh, you and I. At least some of us look normal. Right? His left eye will be covered, like I said, with a thick piece of flesh. And also, there's also something fascinating as well, which a lot of times you'll hear this in many other hadith, which mentions that he will have kathara written on his forehead. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim ta'ala says about this statement, that this means that it is literal. What does this mean? This means that he will go walking around with a tattoo saying disbeliever. Imam Al-Qayyim says this, the famous Imam, the, the, the student of Imam Al-Taymiyyah. Other scholars say that this is not literal, this is metaphorical. Our Prophet وسلم, is saying that his kufr, because in the hadith says that the person that can read the kafara, like he's a disbeliever on his head, is katib wa ghayra katib. Prophet says the one that can read this is someone that knows how to read and someone that doesn't know how to read. So, so the Prophet is saying this, this part of the hadith saying the one that doesn't know how to read is proof that the scholars use that this is more metaphorical, less literal. It means it's something else, meaning his, he is so great in his kufr. What he is doing is so evil that you don't even need to have iman to know that this guy is a disbeliever. That's how bad he is. So say for example, old, older gentlemen or older people, maybe they don't know the Quran really well. If the Jal was to come and the evil that he can commit, these older people that don't know Quran really well, they'll say, oh, this guy's he's an evil person. He's an evil person. Whatever he is doing, he must be an evil person. They will know not because of what he has written on his forehead, but because it is so apparent it is so rampant, the kufr that he is doing, the disbelief that he is doing, the evil that he is doing, all of us can unanimously say, both the ones that can read and the ones that cannot read, we will say that this man is definitely a disbeliever and not a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we mentioned a little bit of description about him, meaning he will have kafara written on his head, whereas the kufr, the disbelief is, is, is very apparent. We also mentioned that one of his eyes will be protruding like a grape, meaning that he will not have one eye in the, 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 the forehead like a lot of people think. He will have two eyes just like me and you, alhamdulillah. But one of his eyes will be protruding like a grape and he will not be able to see with one of his eyes. When you protruding like a grape, what does this mean? That means that if, if I turn to the side and my side profile, the eyes will come out a little bit more. That's all it is. It's not like his eyes are poking out and he's looking around, I'm a Dajjal. No, it just comes out a little bit more than the average person. And that's why the Prophet said that his eyes will protrude like a grape. 
and he will have, like, like we said earlier, uh, light skin tones, basically not as dark as the Arabs during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's a hadith that we want, there's many hadith, we're not going to have time to mention all this hadith, we have, there's, there's, there's many hadith, authentic hadith, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, will mention some hadith of the, of, in Sahih Bukhari, which is the most authentic book after the Qur'an. The companion, the great companion of Abdullah bin Amr radiallahu anhu, the son of Amr Khattab radiallahu anhu, he says that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Whilst I was sleeping, I saw myself performing tawaf around the Kaaba. So he's talking about a dream. When I saw a dark man with straight hair standing between two other men with water dripping from his head. I asked, who is this? They said, the son of Maryam, which is Jesus alayhi salam. Then I turned and saw a lighter complexioned man, well built, with curly hair, blind in his right eye, with his eye looking like a floating grape. I asked, who is this? They said, this is a Dajjal. This hadith is written in Bukhari. When Ibn Umar had this dream, he rushed straight to the Prophet and he informed the Prophet of this, and the Prophet says, this is true. <coughs> Hudayf ibn Yaman radiallahu anhu The famous companion that knows about all of the fitan and all of the trials that will happen in this ummah He says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said He Dajjal will be one eyed, blind or defective in his left eye with thick hair We mentioned here, you see here <coughs> That some of the hadith mentioned left eye, some of the hadith mentioned right eye <coughs> With thick hair and he will have with him paradise and hellfire, but his hell will be paradise, and his paradise will be hell. Inshallah, we'll get to that hadith after some time. Now, there's another hadith of the Prophet wasallam that begins to describe the duration of how long he will be here. Our Prophet wasallam said so, the hadith of an Nawaz bin Sar'an radiallahu anhu, he says that when a Dajjal emerges in his physical form, he will roam the earth for 40 days, riding on a donkey that stretches its ears from the east to the west in a measure of 40 cubits. Our Prophet wasallam is speaking to a group of companions عنهم, that had no idea that you can travel to, from here to Saudi Arabia in one day. He is speaking to a group of people that take six months just to get to Jerusalem from Mecca. Six months on a normal, on foot, it takes a very long time. But alhamdulillah for us, if you want to travel across the world now, you just got to buy a plane ticket, and mashallah, you're on the other side of the world by, t by tomorrow. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is telling the group of the sahaba radiallahu anhu that a dajjal will be using, as we call it, planes. But they were not going to understand that technology. So he says that he will be riding a donkey that will be stretched the ears of the east to the west, and he will be traveling very, very fast in a matter of 40 days. Then the Prophet ﷺ begins to describe these 40 days. He says, the first day amongst you will be like a year. The second day amongst you, when he's around you and in the presence, will be like a month. And the third day will be like a week, and the rest of the days will be like your normal days. I've mentioned this hadith many, many times. And the Sahaba ﷺ, when they heard this hadith, they said, Ya Rasulullah, when a day is like a year, and a day is like a month, and a day is like a week. He, they asked, how will we pray at that time? That is very, very crucial. When the Prophet ﷺ heard them asking them, them this question, instead of asking them, Ya Rasulullah, what should we do to prepare ourselves for a Dajjal? Ya Rasulullah, what, what, what? Precautionary measures should we take? What survival tactics should we do? What should we buy for our homes? The very first thing that they asked was how will we pray? Because they knew, may Allah be pleased with all of them. They knew, so long as you pray, your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is solid, no matter what fitna you will have, you will be okay. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa answered them. Because it's very difficult, how are we gonna pray in a day that's a year? in a day like a month, in a day like a week. The Prophet ﷺ says, do the best you can. That's all he had to say. So let's say, for example, 
If a Dajjal was to come, <clears throat> and one day would be like a year, if we pray five times a day, 365 days in a year, roughly we're looking at 18, 1825, so 1,825 prayers that we pray throughout the entire year. What we have to do as Muslims, make sure when, when that does happen, when a day is like a year, we're praying 1,825 times. When, however that's gonna happen. We don't know how that's gonna happen, but we do the math. The Prophet says you gotta do the math. You gotta do as much as you can, especially in those trying times that we're living in. Some of the, some of the scholars mentioned that. Other scholars mentioned this is not literal, but yet figurative way of speaking. Our Prophet is saying that these days will feel like a year long because of the trauma and what goes on in the world, it will feel like forever. This is why when we have fun as people, we go, oh, where is the time gone? Time flies. We're having a good time. Time flies when you're always having a good time. But when you're being tortured and when you're in jail, oh, time goes by really, really slow. If you tell kids, if you teach kids and you say you have five minutes left until break, they're looking at the time. Especially like for Muslims when it's iftar time. Why is it before in Adhan is very, very long? Oh, we're waiting, come on, hurry up. We're waiting for iftar because you're waiting. It's, it's hard and you're waiting. So when a Dajjal emerges, that day that's like a year, it will feel like a year. Because of the trauma and the fitna and the, the, the trial and calamities that the Ummah will go through, it will feel like a year. But why did the Prophet say the next day will feel like a month and the next day will feel like a week? Because when you are submerged in fitna for so long, it becomes easy for you. It becomes easy for you. First week for those that don't fast in the month of Ramadan is hard. Week one is hard. Oh, fasting, how am I going to do this? But wallahi, that same person in the last 10 days of Ramadan, mashallah, he knows how to fast, he doesn't even have to eat anything anymore. Tarawih, Qiyamul Layl, light work. Qiraat al Qur'an, light work. It's easy for them. So likewise, our Prophet wasallam says that the first day will be the hardest day. The second day will become a little bit easier because you've been accustomed to the fitna. Then the third day, you become more accustomed to the fitna. Then the rest of the days will be like your days. Okay. What are his tests? What will he do? As we know, food will be limited. Resources will be limited, rain will stop, meaning drought, and nothing will grow. Brothers and sisters, for, at least for the newer generation, if you don't understand, when rain doesn't fall, food, we don't have food. At least for the older people, we understand this, but because uh, I think, uh, I would say the average American, when he, wants to, when he wants to eat or buy fruits and vegetables, he just goes to Safeway and buys it. And Safeway should have it, it's no big deal. But guess what? Safeway gets their stuff from farms. And farmers, they rely on water. And if they don't have water, they're not going to produce. And when you don't have water, you don't have life. And when there's no more water, there's no more life. And rain will be scarce and limited. And then people will be fighting each other just for loaves of bread, like I said, or luxuries of just water. And this will be one of his fitna. And he will test people with very, very little fitna. And he will consider himself God. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, the best of the best to ever walk this earth after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They themselves were afraid of a Dajjal. Their iman is way greater than ours. Yet they have all died, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with all of them. Yet for us perhaps, our kids perhaps, and our grandkids perhaps, will see the Dajjal in their lifetime. And they were petrified of this great fitna. They were afraid of this fitna. And the interesting thing here, is that our Prophet wasallam says about Dajjal, he says, and I want you to remember this for the rest of your life, inshallah, and teach your kids this, and hopefully, inshallah, our kids will teach their kids this, وَإِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَيْسَ بِأَعْوَرُ And your Lord is not one-eyed. Now you may be thinking, Mr. Sufyan, we know Allah doesn't have one eye. We know that. That's simple. We learn in Tawheed Aqeedah class. We learn in Islamic schools. We just go on YouTube and it's easy. We know that. There will come a time to brothers and sisters where the only thing they know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is His name. That's it. The only thing they know, the Prophet says in hadith, the only thing that they will know about Allah is just His name, Allah. That's all they know. They don't know anything about Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And at that time, this is why our Prophet وسلم, emphasized, وَإِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَيْسَ بِأَعْوَى Your Lord is not one eye, just remember that. When the fitna gets severe, and you're thinking that He's Allah, just remember, وَإِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَيْسَ بِأَعْوَى And I want, inshaAllah, us, and teaching our kids, and hopefully they will teach their kids, and this will pass on for generations and generations and generations, inshaAllah, وَإِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَيْسَ بِأَعْوَى I want you to remember this. So that way you can tell your kids, so when they do see a dajjal or when we see a dajjal whatever it may be, we remind ourselves, وَإِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَيْسَ بِأَعْوَى Our Lord is not one-eyed. Where will He emerge? Where will He come out from? <clears throat> he will come out from emerge from the direction of the east, which is east of Medina, from a land called Khurasan, which we'll get to inshallah a little bit, and from the Jews of Isfahan. Isfahan is a city in, in Iran today. It is the second biggest community of Jews after Palestine. So Palestine has the biggest group of Jews today, what, what America calls it, Israel. Palestine has the biggest group of Jews today. The second biggest community of collective Jews together is in a city called Isfahan in Iran. And a Dajjal will emerge, ironically, will emerge from the areas of Khurasan, which is modern day Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, that area, that region, and Iran, Dajjal will emerge from there. Does that mean a Dajjal is from there? Absolutely not. There is no delete, there's no proof that a Dajjal is from their, their people, but the hadith states that he will come from there. So perhaps something has to happen in that area in order for a Dajjal to emerge from that area. <coughs> According to the hadith that we mentioned earlier, the Prophet ﷺ said concerning at dajjal he will emerge from the direction of the Syrian Sea or from the direction of the Yemeni Sea, no, rather from the east. Then he began pointing at his east, pointing at the east. And this hadith is mentioned inside Muslim. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he says that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ told us <coughs> that Dajjal will emerge from a land in the east called Khurasan. Like I said, which is modern day Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and stuff like that. Anas ibn Malik says, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the Dajjal will emerge from among the Jews of Isfahan, which is an ancient city in Iran, like I said, and with him will be 70,000 Jews wearing crowns and or shawls. Who will kill the Dajjal? So the Dajjal will wreak havoc for 40 days, we know this. The Dajjal will die at the hands of a Masih Isa ibn Maryam. The, the, the real Messiah, Jesus as indicated of the ahadith, the authentic ahadith of the Prophet yeah. the Dajjal will appear on earth and will gain many many followers, majority of them being women and majority of them being the Jews, spreading his fitna far and wide. No one will escape his fitna except for a few of the believers. So I don't care what iman you have, your brothers and sisters, if you tell yourself, you know, if I'm in front of the Dajjal, you know, I got this. No, the Prophet, if the Prophet is going to tell us that he is the greatest fitna ever in human history, trust me, dear brother and sister of 2024, your iman is not as great as the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. Then the Prophet continues telling us what will happen uh, when, when a Dajjal meets Isa ibn Maryam. <coughs> he says, at that point, Isa ibn Maryam will descend to the eastern minaret in Damascus. And the believing slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather around him. So from the time of the beginning of the corruption of Syria until now, these are pieces to the puzzle. These are pieces to the puzzle. Dajjal will not emerge, Isa alayhi salam will not emerge if Syria was a thriving community. If Syria was a beautiful place, it all has to play like chess pieces. All like pieces to a puzzle. It all has to unravel itself. And Dajjal will descend, or I'm sorry, Isa ibn Maryam will descend to the eastern minaret in Damascus. At this time, I remember, subhanAllah, I remember when, when my teacher was telling us the, the Ashat al Sa'a, when the signs of the Day of Judgment, this was way back, I would say maybe 15 years ago. Wallah ta'ala, if it still exists today. But when Bashar al Assad, the, the leader of Syria, was causing havoc in his land, the masjid that they call Masjid Isa ibn Maryam, the reason why they call it this masjid, there is because that is the very land that the hadith says that Isa alayhi salam will descend upon. 
that masjid, despite the airstrikes and the bombs and the explosives and whatever it may be, at that time, Allah I don't know about now, but at, at that time was still intact. It was still in good condition, that masjid. And the minaret of Damascus was still there. That was like 15 years ago. And I've never checked now if the masjid is still there. Wallah ta'ala adam. But ironically, that's the masjid that they claim that Isa alayhi salam will descend upon. Now, a dajjal will, <coughs> this hadith continues, and he says, he will lead them towards a dajjal, but who at the time of the descent, uh, of, the descent of Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam will be heading for Bayt al Maqdis. Isa alayhi salam will catch up to him, and Isa alayhi salam will say in a nutshell, I have unfinished business with you, and Dajjal will be melting. He basically will be melting out of fear of Isa alayhi salam. A Dajjal will try to enter into Mecca and Medina, or will be prevented by angels holding weapons, not allowing him into Mecca and Medina. And he would point and the outskirts of Medina uh, in, uh, to the White Palace, as he calls it, a Dajjal calls it, the white palace of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us this hadith, his masjid was not white. His masjid was just run down and normal. Why is it called the white palace? Believe it or not, if you were on go to Google Images today in a bird's eye view of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's palace, it's white. And a Dajjal, believe it or not, <coughs> he will stand or or. You know, position himself outside of Medina because he wants to enter Medina, but he will not be able to. He will position himself in the outskirts of Medina. And for those that have been to Medina, and especially my school, I remember even my dorm, my room, the window used to face the exact mountain that a Dajjal is going to be on. And this mountain, we call it in the student world, we call it the mountain of a Dajjal because that's the very mountain that he's going to be on. And funny thing here is that the king of Saudi Arabia decides to put a palace on top of that mountain. Mm. You see what's going on here, your brothers and sisters? Something's going on here. Why out of all places, you could have placed a palace, because for those that have been to Mecca before, the king's palace is right next to the Kaaba. And when he prays Tarawih and Qiyam al and he wants to pray in the Haram, there's a palace right next to the Kaaba. You've seen it. If you pray on the roof, you can see a big building next to it. That's his palace, the king's palace. He put the palace of Mecca next to the Kaaba. But as far as the palace of Medina, it's at the exact location of the mountain of where the Dajjal is going to be. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure all of these shaykhs of Saudi Arabia came to the king and said, wait, wait a minute. The hadith says that this is the mountain. Why would you do that? Like I said to you before, Allah is the one that guides the kings of this, the Muslim countries, prime ministers of Muslim countries. They are Arab speaking people. They can pick up the Quran and read the Quran just like how you and I can read the Quran. <coughs> But it is not the Qur'an that guides, it is Allah that guides. It is a book of guidance by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like I said, people can study the Qur'an in colleges and universities. But if Allah does not want to open their heart, their hearts are not going to be open. Summun, bukmun, umyun, fahum Dumb, dumb, deaf, blind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can read the same hadith as I can. But if Allah wants to open your eyes, Allah will open it. If Allah wants to close your eyes, Allah will close those eyes and continue to close those eyes. These same people, dear brothers and sisters, they read the hadith, they pray like us, they walk like us, they fast like us, they pay zakat just like us. But when Allah doesn't want to guide you, that is very scary. This is why more than 17 times in a day, we are encouraged to say in Surah Al-Fatiha, إِهْدِنَ الصُّرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us through the straight path. That is the most frequent dua that the Muslim makes in his or her entire life. And that is the dua of guidance, because that is very, very important especially in the end of times that we're living in, and especially at the end of times of a Dajjal. Anyhow, he goes and continues, Isa a.s. says, I have some business with you, you will not get away from me. Then he will catch up to Isa a.s. Um, sorry, a Dajjal, and will kill him with his spear. His followers will flee, the followers of a Dajjal, pursued by the Muslims who will kill them, and the trees and the rocks at this time will say, O oh Muslim, O oh slave of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come and kill him, apart from al gharqat which is a specific type of tree, and this is, as the Prophet says, for this is one of the trees of the Jews. And the funny thing is, like I said, these Yahud study Islam more than Muslims, they are currently planting this tree of al gharqat everywhere. They're planting this tree because they know this is a tree that's not going to, or I'm sorry, going to protect them. So they know this hadith of the Prophet but they're using it to their advantage. 
How do we protect ourselves? We'll conclude with that. Number one is du'a. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to make a du'a in a tashahud, especially the last tashahud. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala says that if you do not make this du'a in the last tashahud of your prayer, your prayer is invalid. This is just his theory, this is just his madhab. And that, that du'a is the famous du'a. Allahumma inni a'udhi bika min adab al-qabr, wa min adab jahannam, wa min fitnat al-mahya wal-mamat, wa min sharri fitnat al-masih al-dajjal. You're asking Allah to protect you from four things. Allahumma inni a'udhi bika. Oh Allah, I seek your protection from adab al-qabr, from the punishment of the grave, of the, of the grave, وَمِنْ عَذَابِ جَهَنَّمْ and from the punishments of Jahannam, the punishment of hellfire, وَمِنْ عَذَابِ وَمِنْ فِتْنَةِ الْمَحْيَا وَالْمَمَاتِ and from the trials of life and the trials of death, وَمِنْ شَرِّ فِتْنَةِ الْمَسِيحَ الدَّجَّالِ and I ask you Allah to protect me from the evils of the tests of the the, the great deceiver at dajjal other ways to protect ourselves is reciting, memorizing, preserving the very first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. And this is why we're talking about the Dajjal today. It's because we're talking about the Tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf. Preserving the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf in your life, studying these first 10 verses, memorizing these first 10 verses, and implementing these first 10 verses in your life will inshallah protect you from a Dajjal. Establish a strong relationship with your maker, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not one eye. Also, establishing a strong relationship with your maker, make sure your prayers are on check. Your prayers are good. Like the Sahaba radiallahu anhu, when they were asked by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa or when they were informed that his day will be like a month and a month, or a day will be like a week and so on, they said, فَكَيْفَ نُصَلِّي Their main concern was prayer. Likewise for us, dear brothers and sisters of Islam, our main concern should be, especially in the time of living, is our salah, your connection. If you're praying five times a day, وَلِلَّهِ الْحَمْدِ Ask yourself, how are those prayers that you are praying five times a day? Yes, you may be praying five times a day, alhamdulillah, but do you lack khushu' in your prayers? Concentration in your prayers? Are you distracted easily in your prayers? How well is your wudu, for example, which is a prerequisite of salah? Another way to protect ourselves is to learn your deen. Learn, as we say, what we're doing now, alhamdulillah, learning about the fitna of the dajjal. Just because you can't see something doesn't mean that you don't believe it. We are taught that. We live in a day and age right now is they say, take a pic where it didn't happen. Show me proof where it didn't happen. And subhanAllah, subconsciously, we're living in this day and age where if we're told something, we're like, we gotta see it physical, we gotta see tangible, or else we're not going to believe it. If our Prophet wasallam told us of this great fitna, for wallahi, from wallahi, we're going to believe our messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If he told us that Dajjal existed, exists and he will continue to exist. Wallah ta'ala how, we don't know how, we don't know where, but if our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, then automatically we believe it 110%. Just because we cannot see it, doesn't mean that we don't believe it. Like I said, the system of a Dajjal right now, I would say at least today, tonight, the system of a Dajjal is working very, very hard. So that way when he does come in his physical form, it is very, very easy. And that 40 days, because that's all the time he has, the people will be fooled and deceived by his power. Another way that he will test the people is that he will bring your families back to life. Those that have lost loved ones, mothers and fathers, and he will use shaitan. And shaitan will come in the form of your mom and your dad and will say to you, O oh son or O oh daughter, believe in him. He is Allah. Look at me. He brought me back to life just for me to say this. And majority of the people will fall into his deception. Other, other tests that he will have, he will say to the people, if I, if you, if you, if I show you that, if I can split a man into two and bring him back to life, Will you believe me that I am God? And the people will say, of course, only Allah can do that. And he will use shaitan in disguise of a human being and split him into two and bring him back. And he will say, now you believe me? And the masses will begin to believe this person. Our Prophet ﷺ says another hadith, that he will come with fire and he will come with water. And he will tell the people to take the water. And at this time you are in desperate need of anything. 
any sustenance and you will take the water. Our Prophet وسلم, says in the hadith, he says, jump in the fire. And when he mentioned this hadith, he says, close your eyes. Because it's, it's going to be basically what he's trying to highlight. It is going to be a painful experience. It's not going to be easy to jump in that fire. Jump in that fire for indeed it is water. Per the hadith of the Prophet wasallam. It might not look like it to you when you're, when you're in front of a Dajjal. But the Prophet says, when you are, if you are in front of him, and he will present you fire and water, do not go to his water for indeed that is his fire. Go inside the fire because that is water. And Prophet says in, in the hadith, to close your eyes, meaning of how difficult it will be. And we know the famous hadith, Prophet says, at a time of fitna, your deen will be like holding on to hot coal. This is that time. When a Dajjal will be, it will be holding on to hot coal. The Prophet وسلم, said, when a Dajjal sees Isa, the actual Messiah, he begins to dis dissolve and run, melt, flee, as we mentioned, and runs away because he knows that he's a fake and the real Messiah is present. And as we know, that a Dajjal will be killed by Isa alayhi salam. This fitna, dear brothers and sisters, is out of the ten signs, major signs of the Day of Judgment. This is the last of them, and this is the biggest of them. This is the last of them in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We know the last of them in this world will be, uh, there's a dukhan, the smoke, and then the ajuj and is after uh, the, uh, the Dajjal, per the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. We know a Dajjal is the biggest fitna amongst these ten, and it will come during our time, whether we are alive to see it or our kids will be able to see it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He protects us and our offspring from this great fitna. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to what, of whatever iman that we have preserved in our lives, that He preserves our iman until our last and dying days, and that our last words be in this dunya, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of our good deeds and forgive us our shortcomings. This will be the end of Surah Al-Kahf. Inshallah, next week we will jump into the tafsir of Juz Amma, moving on into surahs that most of us are familiar with, Inshallah, next Friday. But this is the end of the, the, the stories or the gems that we can take from Surah Al-Kahf. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of our efforts and forgive us our sins. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept all of our good deeds and grant to us and our families Jannat and Firdaus al -Ala. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to grant us Jannah in this dunya and also grant us Jannah in the akhirah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a life of ease in this dunya and to not make us tested in any way, shape, or form in this dunya. Ya Rabbil Alameen, we ask you of a life of ease in this dunya. We ask you of a life of ease in al-barzakh. And we ask you of life of ease ultimately in al-akhirah. Ya Rabbi al -Alami, we ask you to forgive us for our sins, both minor or major. We ask you, Ya Rabbi al -Alami, to accept all of our good deeds, both minor or major. Anything that I said that was good was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Him alone. Anything that I said that was bad or offensive was from myself and the shaytan. Wa jazakum Allahu khayr. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.